In, in this great United States of America, we have that great privilege. We've been talking about the power of a clear conscience. And I know some really don't want to hear about that, but it's important we have a clear conscience. Uh, some people don't understand the level of that. Uh, but the young boy who called the pastor of a local church because his mom was very ill and she was in the hospital. So he calls up and said, my mom's very sick with this contagious flu. She's in the hospital. I want to know if you could go by and see my mom. Well, the pastor thinks for a minute and he knows this boy and her family and they're not members of his church. He knows they go to another church down the street. He said to him, well, don't you think you should be talking to Brother Simon about that? Uh, go by and pray for your mom. The little boy said, yeah, but we didn't want to take the chance that Brother Simon might catch whatever mom has. So <laughs> That's why Tim makes the contagious visits. <laughs> it is important that we have a clear conscience, and the conscience is a unique thing, and I'd like to take just a moment, because I don't think a lot of us understand what a conscience is and how a conscience works, so let me just give a little introductory stuff. Last week, we talked about having a clear conscience. In fact, we used a definition from uh, Life Action Ministries that said a clear conscience is the ability to say to, that there's not a single person that I've ever wronged, hurt, or offended that I have not gone back to and asked for forgiveness and sought to make it right. Now, I don't know about you, but that first part, when I first started reading that, it, it, I, I kind of stumbled a little bit because uh, uh, I, I've wronged a lot of people. I've thought it hurt people. I've hurt people's feelings. We all have to some degree at different times and places or... You're still single, perhaps. Anyway, <laughs> but it's the idea that, yeah, that's, offenses are going to come and problems are going to come, but will I go back and make those offenses right? Will I, will I seek to be a person who has a, who has a heart that's pure towards other people or, or am I harboring things? And we talked about, you know, that kind of, uh, getting that, that, that kind of heart that's clean and the conscience is clear with each other and with other people and our friends and families and relationships at work or wherever. And also about me even making restitution, and I shared a few personal testimonies. But in talking about a clear conscience, you know exactly what is, a, what is a clear conscience and what is a conscience to start with. Well, it's that God-given means by which every human distinguishes right from wrong, dealing with morality and immorality. That there's something that God's given us that, you know, that should check off and speak to our heart and deal with our heart before we make decisions that are wrong. It can either make you feel guilty or perhaps uh, shame. Uh, you know, or maybe could even your conscience in such a state that you're oblivious to even feeling shame or guilty about some particular things. In fact, I believe that the conscience is ever in an ever increasing state of training, fine tuning, becoming sensitized, or becoming desensitized. That your conscience may not be affected; it may not bother you about some things. As a Christian, our our conscience, that part of us where God deals and brings conviction to and speaks to our heart. That, that should be something that's ever being tuned. You know, the Lord is, we're learning how to be more sensitive. We're letting the word of God shape our hearts and our minds and our life. And so we're becoming more sensitive. Uh, you know, but let's take on the hand somebody who's not a believer, perhaps, perhaps someone who's been grown up in a, in, a, uh, in, in a situation or environment where certain behaviors are just ingrained to them that, that are biblically wrong, that the scriptures speak, speak clearly against and says this is wrong. But yet they haven't been exposed to that thing. Maybe it's adultery, homosexuality, extortion. I mean, to some people, those are perfectly legitimate ways to live and are accepted wholeheartedly by certain people, all right? Uh, then my conscience would be immediately offended by those things, whereas their conscience is not set off. In fact, their conscience is set off when I speak about those things in such a way it offends them. Uh, why is that? Well, the idea is that, you know, because the, the conscience is susceptible to training by your environment, by the way you grow up, by the, by the culture that we live in. And this culture that we live in is ever uh, increasingly becoming less sensitive to what is moral and what is righteous instead of the other way. Whereas a Christian, the longer you walk with the Lord, you become more sensitive and your conscience becomes a little more discerning to those things. So, you know, we, we wanna understand that this conscience is, is, is not a complete guide, all right? Uh, to how we conduct our life. And uh, it ultimately is subject to instruction itself. The revelation of scriptures ought to uh, affect our, our conscience. The Holy Spirit, as he speaks to our human spirit, you know, will teach us and guide us into what a good conscience is. The human spirit is controlled what I believe is the heart, all right? That's where we believe everything. The Bible tells us even, for with the heart, a man believes unto righteousness. So here's this, this control room, but my heart, 
is influenced by my conscience, and my conscience should be influenced by the Word of God and by the will of God. But what happens if I kind of say I want to take shelter from my conscience and my heart is not going to respond to the Holy Spirit and I'm not going to let God deal with me in, in certain ways? Well, when the heart begins to seek refuge from the conscience, it becomes hardened against light and its truth. And in fact, the Bible says you can sear or brand the consciences with a, with a hot iron. That scripture is given to us in 1 Timothy 2 where it talks about a group of people who, who are living in hypocrisy and they're speaking lies in hypocrisy. It says they have their own conscience seared with a hot iron. What's that mean? Is that they're not hearing God speak to them anymore. In fact, if you choose to live that way where you start cutting off the spirit of God's influence in your life, Ephesians says, you know, you get past the point where you're without feeling. He's talking about this internal move of the Spirit of God in your life. And who being past feelings have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all in cleanliness with greediness, or on the other hand, let's say we expose my conscience and my heart where it's not re taking refuge away from what God's speaking to me, and I choose to live before the Lord. All the things that could be harmful and negative by not having a clear conscience and a right conscience before God, I'm bringing everything into the light, and I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to me about things. I, I receive from the Lord in the moment of my honesty and my confession before the Lord a washing and a cleansing with the precious blood of Jesus Christ that removes all those negative stains and taints of what a guilty conscience or a hardened conscience or a hardened heart will bring in my life. We want to live kind of ever in the light. The Bible says we walk in the light as he is in the light. And then it goes on to say, and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we don't, we don't want to shut off the spirit of God. And all too often, uh, when God starts speaking to us, whether it's through sermons or something we hear on the radio or, or reading, and, uh, but sometimes there's a tendency just to close the door. Say, I don't want to deal with that. I, you know, I don't want to deal with it. For whatever reason, I don't want to deal with it because maybe it's something I enjoy doing the Lord doesn't want me doing. You know? <laughs> or maybe it's something I'm not doing I should be doing. And we just shut the door to the God's dealing with our spirit. Much better is it to say, Lord, here's my life. Like David, the psalmist we read last week, Lord, seek me, search me, and try me, see if there's any wicked way. Hebrew 9 says, says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, which is the way we're supposed to be living our life, that, that the Lord will do. He will cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve a living God. In other words, God can wash and clear our conscience and cleanse our conscience. That's why Paul, when he's talking to the church in Acts, he, he stood before the church council in Jerusalem. He said, listen, gentlemen, I speak to you with a perfectly clear conscience. How can you have a perfectly clear conscience? It doesn't mean that our conscience is perfect. It means that we are living in the light of God's word. We're letting God deal with us in our needs and our sins and our failures. And our, we're just being ominous and open with God. And so we're not hiding things and we're not shoving things below the surface where they're not going to be seen by others. We're being, we're being generally cleansed by the Holy Spirit precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're learning more to be sensitive to the will of God and discerning about the things of God because our conscience is clear. Now, if it's not clear, it's going to affect us. And just as much as I took that, uh, that, that definition from Life Action Ministries, there's also a, a couple lists I want to share with you. One, and I thought it was so good, I, you know, Mike had sent me this, Mike Miller and some materials, and I didn't put it all together, but there's ones I think some of them were just kind of a little repetitive, but how does it affect me negatively uh, if I don't have a clear conscience? If I'm not willing to deal with the stuff God wants me to deal with? I, I say, you know, but if I don't want to clear out the closets that are in here and I just want to hide, how does that affect me? And it will affect you negatively in more ways than you probably imagine. One is, I think the most obvious is there's no power in witnessing. First Peter talks about we live our life in such a way with a clear conscience so that when people slander us, you know, basically it won't make any effect because, you know, the truth will be found out that we're living for Jesus and we're doing what's right. But in that passage as he's talking, he's talking about the fact that when our conscience is clear, there's a boldness that we experience in our witness with Christ. I know a lot of people, as I've talked to about sharing Christ with other people, a common kind of excuse that comes back is, well, you know, it's, I, I, I'm really not right with the Lord, and I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I just don't really witness to Christ. I have a better solution. How about you just get right with the Lord? 
And then there's a, there's a basis on which, you know, that, that we speak freely and we speak boldly because our heart is right. And we're not, you know, we're not, we're not under the accusation of the enemy. So we walk in boldness. Another negative is going through this role of religion, but we lose the heart and the desire and the love and the motivation to be what God's called us to be. That first Samuel passage that's mentioned there in, in chapter 15, verse 22 has to do when the king has been told, King Saul has been told to, you know, uh, basically annihilate the enemy and get rid of everything, the livestock, the, the king, the, the every, everything's supposed to go. And the king doesn't do it. He saves the livestock and he saves the king alive and destroys the rest of it. And this, the prophet Samuel comes to him and says, have you obeyed the Lord? And he says, yes, I've done all that the Lord said, but he hadn't. All right. And there came this little conscious reminder all of a sudden this, in the background, there was this, and moo. And Samuel the prophet says, what meaneth this lowing of oxen and the bleeding of sheep? In other words, if you did what all the Lord said do, then what's that? What's that? You know? And, and he said, listen, listen, Saul, the Lord is more interested in your obedience. Because what Saul said, oh, I'm going to use that for a sacrifice for the Lord. I, I'm going to put that to use for God. He said, listen, the Lord's more interested in, in, your, in having you obeying him completely so you can live with a clear conscience and doing what's right than you offering some sacrifice. But all too often, I think it's within the natural order of our fallen nature is that when we're not right with God, to kind of double up on our other efforts. You know, I'm not, I'm not really being a witness, but I'm coming to church more often. Or I'm not really reading the Word, but I'm doing this. And kind of a, this substitute thing that we get into. Another thing that I thought was an interesting side effect was just general nervousness. In Proverbs 10, it talks about what the wicked fears will come upon him, but the desires of the righteous will be granted. And the idea is this, if, you, if your heart is not right, then you're living with, on, this, on, on kind of the edge that something's going to go wrong because you know as a Christian, when your heart's not right, you're not really fully, you can't really fully expect the blessings of God on your life or the grace of God because you've opened the door to some things. And, you know, it's like it's, if we open the door to the enemy, even we get this foot in the door, then we're inviting trouble into our life. And so I think it creates this, this, this emotional, this kind of spiritual nervousness. Also, we're always on the defensive. And in Proverbs 21, it also says, every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs their hearts. All right? We can sit and justify, another passage in Scripture says, we can justify every deed of the flesh. What's that mean? I can find an excuse for everything I'm doing wrong. Amen? I can find an excuse for everything I'm doing wrong. I can, I can justify it. I, you know, I come up with a good excuse. But hey, that defensive posture is a hard way to live your life. It's better to live in the freedom of Jesus Christ and deal with those issues so you're not always having to justify the things that are wrong and be on the defensive. Along with that is anxiety and tensions and guilt and frustrations. All right? You remember the story in Matthew where the Lord Jesus is talking about forgiveness? And remember, the king brings this man in who owes the king a great deal, and the king forgives him of this massive amount of money that he owes the king. Great deal of money. And then the man is excited, he's you know, rejoicing that he wasn't thrown into this debtor's prison, and he walks out and he sees somebody who owes him just a little tiny bit. Now he's just been forgiven an incredible amount, but he finds this man who owes him just a little tiny bit, and he, he begins to just rail on him and has him thrown into prison because he can't pay it back. And the king hears about it, and the passage goes on to say it like this, and his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. He's talking about relationships. He's talking about forgiving other people. And if you can't forgive someone a little bit, even if it was a big deal, God who forgave you of everything... You know, then you're exposing yourself to what he calls here the tortures. You're exposing yourself to problems and you're exposing yourself to frustration and to guilt. And there's a lot of people living in these emotional prisons today that shouldn't be there that they would just simply say, hey, I need to forgive so-and-so and, -so and I, I'm going to forgive them in the name of Jesus and do so and experience freedom in your life that comes from forgiveness. Along with this, and there's all kind of stacks on each other, is this fears. The Bible talks about the wicked flees when no man pursues. That's, a, that's another issue. But here's one, the inability to make wise decisions in the light of our ultimate goal. I love this passage in 1 Timothy. I shared verses 8 and 9 last week, but Paul is talking to Timothy about the importance of living your life right. And he says, you know what, Timothy? The goal of our instruction is love. Let me catch that again. The goal of our instruction is what? What's he saying? Everything I'm teaching you and everything I'm leading you and everything I'm instructing you is to teach you how to love God 
and to love people. He says, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. If that's God's goal for my life is to be more like Christ and more than God is love for me to be more love, all right, in my life, how's he do? He said, that's going to come from a clear conscience and a pure heart and a sincere faith. But what if my conscience isn't clear and I'm not being obedient to the Lord? Hey, then I'm, I'm going to make bad decisions because I've left the goal out. You know, if you don't have goals in your life, and there should be goals, and I believe, I'm a, I'm a goal-setting guy, I believe in goals. There's goals in my spiritual life. The ultimate goal is to be like Christ, right? Who is the, all the, the, the personification of everything that love is, that we would love others, all right, as we love ourselves. We love God, heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. That's the goal. But if I don't keep that goal before me, then I'm going to start making bad decisions, I'm going to make dumb decisions. I'm going to make decisions that lead me in the wrong place that are nowhere near where I should be going. So we, we can easily make mistakes. And here's the where I fear is I just jumped ahead a while ago from Proverbs 28 when it says, the wicked flee when no man pursues. You know, this reminds me of the story of Jacob and Esau in Scripture. He just, you know, Esau saw, uh, Jacob saw Esau. Remember, he cheats him out of his birthright. And he starts living in constant fear because he has a, he has a guilty conscience of what he's done. And he's running and he's hiding and the day comes when Jacob is just across the river and he's like, oh man, it's all coming to an end now. I don't know what I'm going to do. It's going to... It's just the same idea. That when we don't do what we should do, there's these, these fears that get it, it built into our mind, into our psyche, into our heart and our soul. They're just, in, in, you know, or, or, or sometimes they're just ridiculous fears. But why live that way is the goal here. Why allow yourself to have this kind of negative thing that goes on in your heart and life that keeps you from being what God wants you to be? With this... And this is where it just starts piling up, all right? And this is how we learned, you know, if we could make some right decisions here in our life, how God would liberate us on so many different levels, from emotional levels to physical well-being levels to, I mean, to spiritual levels. Because if we don't, then we start entering into another world of depression and fatigue. In Proverbs 20, verse 27, in Psalms 32, it talks about the, what happens when people aren't willing to get right the things that God is telling them to do. I mean, what would it be like today in people's lives if they just start hearing God and believing God and obeying God, you know? If they just got back, that's called the life of faith. If we just start choosing a life of faith, how much better would it be? And there's so many people that live with such despair and such fatigue and such you know, on the edge of nervous breakdown because they haven't simply learned to allow God to take charge. This, this body is God's temple, am I right? That he lives in a body. Once you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and becomes, he's, in, he's inhabiting your life now. He's filling your life now. But if we keep grieving him and we're rejecting his instruction to our life, then we just open ourselves to everything possible in the world. Psalms 32, 1 through 4, catch this. How blessed. And that's a big word which has to do with happiness, fullness, completeness, all right? How complete and full and happy you are when your transgression is forgiven and your sin is covered. It's a good verse, amen? It's, it's a great memory verse. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered? Verse 2. And how blessed, all right, how blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and the man in whose spirit there is no deceit or guile or bitterness, all right? He's not hiding anything. He's not bitter about stuff. How blessed is that person? In other words, how unblessed is that person who's not getting right with God? How unblessed is that person who won't forgive? How unblessed is that person whose transgression is not forgiven? But that, and he goes on to that. He said, he, and he's, he's telling his testimony, all right? This is a real story about a man. He says, I'm walking the blessing and the grace, the prosperity of God, enjoy my life, and not so fatigued and depressed and fearful and anxious, all right? Or here, here's, here's this, this option. He says, here's what happened before I got right with God. Verse 3, when I kept silent about my sin, when I wouldn't deal with it, my body wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, day and night, I felt your hand heavy upon me. My vitality, my strength for living was drained away as with the fever, heat of summer. And then he attaches this little word to that, Selah. Think about that. Blessing or depression? Blessing, happiness, peace, 
joy, freedom, or fatigue, vitality being snapped from you. For the Christian, for those of us who know Jesus and love Jesus, the place that God has called us to is a place of freedom. And there's only one place, the way to walk in this, that's receiving truth as he speaks it to your heart and that mind. It's allowing your conscience to be open to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, same with me. If there's something in me that's hindering my walk with you, my relationship, my life, I want to get it right. The, the ninth side effect of this not, is this judgmental attitude, I think, which is pretty obvious in Matthew 7. Don't judge others, you know, so you'll not be judged. From the way you judge others, you'll be judged. And by the standards you measure, to be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and not consider the beam or the moat that's in your own eye? So go get that beam or that moat out of your own eyes, and then you can take that little speck that's in your brother's eyes. But all too often, you know what it is we, we see in other people? I've discovered in my own personal life, what I see most in somebody else's life is something where I probably am, something I'm real familiar with and makes it easy to spot to somebody else. Can I get a witness? I know, I know like last week it was super silent in here. I knew, I knew it'd be the same today because these, these are not, you know, happy sermons necessarily. Say this. They can be, but this is stuff that kind of plows real deep, you know. This stuff that gets us down to the nitty-gritty where we are in our walk in life, not what we say we are, but where we really are. But look at, look at the, 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 the spectrum of, 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 of where, we, where we go when we just don't allow God to, to speak to our heart. We, we, we become judgmental and you know, hypocritical in, in our lives and willing to point out everybody else's failures but not recognize our own and our own heart and life. The tenth and last of the negatives, and there were more in this particular list that Mike shared with me, but self-condemnation. And I think this is so true in Proverbs 8 and also in Proverbs 11. The idea is, is it says that this person who you know, is always down himself and he says he, when this guy will get to place, he, would, he becomes just godless in his life. He destroys his mouth with his neighbor. You know, he's, he, he's really just beating up himself all the time. But this is the way it is because you know why it's this way? Because you do have an enemy, and his name is Satan. And he has an, he has an interesting job title. It's really, it, it's really a name that's attached to his name, but, but it's, it's, it describes exactly how Satan works against your life. The Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. So you can be sure whatever's going on in your life that you have failed at some point in your life or some error you've sinned against the Lord in, Satan's going to bring that up to you all the time. And that's why it's important you deal with it because if you don't, here's what happens. You start getting that hard-hearted thing, remember? And the seared conscience. That's the last place you want to go. So Satan comes and he accuses you all the time. Remember, remember what Jesus said about himself? He says, you know, the prince of this world is judged. He's talking to his disciples right before he's going to the cross. And he says, you know, uh, he said, I'm gonna, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He said, but the prince of this world is judged by, by what's getting ready to happen. We're gonna, the cross is getting ready to take place. He said, but when he comes to me, he finds nothing in me. What's that mean? It means that there's nothing in Jesus that's, that Satan could accuse him of. Amen? Now, there's a lot you say in my life, in your life, that you accuse of, not if it's under the blood of Jesus. Not if it's forgiven. Not if we got right with God. I've had people, I've had, you know what? Satan always loves to come back after you've dealt with stuff, doesn't it? Remember, you, you may have heard a sermon on forgiving a brother or spouse or something. And you, you go to that person, you know, and, or you go to the Lord and you confess it and it's gotten right. And then Satan comes in the, about, about 30 minutes later and says, oh, you really didn't forgive them. Oh, you didn't mean that. This is where you have to stand your ground. You just go back to tell the devil, hey, listen, I distinctly remember forgiving them. So get out of here in Jesus' name. And you start walking in the freedom. You, you, you move away from the accusation now because he doesn't have anything in it because you did what God told you to do. And then you try something, well, you shouldn't have. I know I shouldn't have, but I did, but it's under the blood of Jesus. So th that's the name. But there are some positives. And of course, you could flip every one of those to the positive side and see the positives of that. But one is, I think that's very clear. Because this becomes a mark of maturity in life. Listen to this passage in Hebrews 5, 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. In other words, as you grow in Christ, as you're going on with the Lord, and as long as you've known the Lord, you're now you're accustomed to hearing the truth and hearing the word. And you know now that when you hear the truth, it's not because some preacher's trying to condemn you or make you feel guilty. He's sharing truth with you so you can walk in freedom, right? And now you're becoming accustomed to that. You say, hey, hey, tell me the truth. You're, you're the kind of guy now that says, hey, help me be accountable. You're that kind of person that says, I want to go deeper. This is great. This is the way to live my life. Right with God, all right? So, hey, if you see me falling, you know, ring my bell. <laughs> Wake me up because I don't want to live that way. I want to live the right way. 
So what's happening here is, is maturity is starting to take place. So you say, I, need, I, I, want, I want deeper truth. It goes on in verse four, 14, it says, Solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. What's he saying here? Let me say it again. Solid food is for the mature. Who are these people? It says, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. What does that mean? That means God spoke a word. You didn't run from it. God showed you light. You didn't run from it. God exposed something in your heart. You didn't run from it. You practiced the truth. You chose to believe what God said. You have a clear conscience. And the more that you do that, he says, you have, you have now, you're developing this unique ability to discern what is right, to discern what is wrong. You're learning to walk with a clear conscience. Now you're not having to go to the Lord all the time to confess what you did as much as you were doing before because, hey, hey you're starting to learn a lesson. You're making right decisions. You're making right choices. Whereas before in your young spiritual life, oh, and it was every day the same old thing over and over again. Hey, but now you're responding to the truth and maturity is taking place in your life. You're letting the Lord speak to your mind and you're letting your heart be, you know, that, that throne place of grace. You're letting that, 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 that develop. And this is what the second part of that is. There's this, you're practicing this, this, this righteousness. You're exercising, it says in that, in that verse, in, in chapter five is one translation puts it. And what's happening? Your inner man is becoming stronger and stronger. And this is where Paul's talking in Acts 24 about having a clear conscience and the strength that we can experience in our life because we have a clear conscience. Another positive is just the freedom now. We can rejoice in everything. There's a victory now that, that's ours. And I, I don't have some of these verses on, on the scripture. I kind of pinned some of these in a little late after I've been working on them on the, the PowerPoint, but in verse 12, he's talking about our, our freedom in Christ and, you know, how we've, we're believing the Word of God now. He says, for our good confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience that in holiness and godly sincerity, this is not in flesh to fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially towards you. He said, hey, we have this freedom and the grace of God now that we're walking with a clear conscience and our attitude towards you is right and our love for you is real, we're not just going through pretense. Another part of this was this, this freedom and we talked about how Satan comes to accuse us and that's his favorite weapon against us. Hey, next to our faith and the word of God and the blood of Jesus, your clear conscience is a powerful weapon. You know, that he, can't, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't have that to hold on. It, it's not something he can grab anymore and say, you, you blew it here, you messed up here. No, we've dealt with it now. It's under the blood of Jesus. We have, we have this freedom now to overcome the enemy. That passage in 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19 is where Paul was saying some people have made a shipwreck out of their spiritual life because they've seared their conscience, you know, and they don't have a pure heart anymore. We, we let stuff just fill this, this, this heart and fill our life that's not right with God, and we won't get it right with God. Therefore, we're not walking in that freedom. The fifth thing was this. It's freedom to share faith with boldness, which is the flip side of that first one that list a while ago, is that we can have boldness now. We can have boldness now because we're right with God, and we know that God cleanses us of sin, so I can tell you God can forgive your sins, and I can say it with great boldness. Why? Because God's forgiven me of my sins. I can preach to you about getting right with a brother that you're not right with because I had to get right with a brother I wasn't right with. Or I can talk to you about getting right with a spouse. Why? Because I have freedom because I've done that in my life when, when I've failed in those areas. So the more that you walk in freedom here and the more that you're obeying the Lord, one is you won't fall as frequently because you're growing and you're maturing and you're, you're, you're going farther down the road. But when you do, you know, I can get this right. I know the hindrance it creates in my life. And I don't want to end up way down the road, apart from God, not where I'm supposed to be, and missing all these opportunities that I have in grace and in faith to be what God's called me to be because I was too interested in getting my way or just kind of nurturing my hurt feelings. And I think along with that, Psalms 32 verses would be the, the sixth thing here. And that's all I put on this particular list. That it does affect our health. It does affect your physical appearance when your heart is right with God, when you're not resisting the Holy Spirit, all right? I really believe it affects us in, in, our, in our physical well-being. There's a great book written years ago. I'm not a 100% believer in every page of the book, but the majority of it was really good. And this came out, I guess, maybe in the 50s, 60s, 70s, somewhere back. You know, yeah, I'm older like that. It was called None of These Diseases. And in Scripture, in, in, in Exodus and Leviticus, the Lord was telling people if they would do this, this, and this, and this, then they wouldn't experience certain diseases in their body. 
But we, we ignore that in the culture today. We just do whatever we want. The Bible says in the last days, people's God would be their belly. What's that mean? Their appetites would control them. Not the Holy Spirit, not the will of God, just whatever their lustful desires were, whether they're carnal and, you know, whatever kind of desires. It could be from immoral desires to just appetites for food and gluttony and drugs and alcohol and smoking. It's amazing, you know. You end up, you know, 50 years down the road, you're in a hospital, you're missing one lung and half a liver because of all the stuff you've done to your body. And we're saying, oh, God, please heal me in Jesus' name. <laughs> you know, it'd be a lot easier to get your life right now so you don't have to end up like that. Can I get a witness? Can you know how many times I've gone to see people in, in the hospital in the cancer ward at different times and, and, you know, and see people there for you know, outpatient cancer treatments and they're outside sitting on the bench smoking cigarettes? Say, somebody ring the bell louder. <laughs> you know? What are we doing to ourselves? What are you doing to yourself? You know, and then we want to get mad at God because look what God let happen to me. Maybe you left the door open. Oh, that got real quiet, didn't it? I was expecting a hearty amen on that. <laughs> Maybe we just did stuff we shouldn't be doing. Maybe we ignored the word of God and the will of God and the ways of God and just did what we wanted to do because we don't want to get too radical. We, we have our excuses, right? We'll give you a couple of common, not that you necessarily need them. Why don't we get these things right? Well, perhaps it's a physical relationship with somebody. I'm really not right, brother, sister, whatever, you know, somebody in the church. Uh, it happened so long ago, Pastor Joe. Where does the Bible teach that time turns wrong things into right things? I don't think it's there. How about, well, they moved away. My response, hmm. Have you heard of the Internet? You can find anybody on the Internet. Yeah, you can find anybody on the Internet if you're really wanting to find them. Another one says, well, it was such a small thing, you know. If it's so small, then why do you still remember it? The size of an offense is not the issue. An offense is an offense. How about this? Well, pastor, things have gotten so much better. Well, good feelings are really no substitute for doing the right thing and for justice and forgiveness and restoration and restitution. Amen? He'll harm my reputation. Humility 101. Your pride does not get to stay intact when you've been wrong. You take heart and remember this, God gives grace to the humble. And if you don't remember this about grace, it's not just that he's forgiven you of what you've done. Grace is the power to go do what's right now. And he'll give you the grace to take care of it. Well, Joe, if I do that, it's going to cost me money. Remember last week I talked about situation I had to deal with it would cost me money if I did get right with God but hey being right with God is far worth any price that I have to look at hey, if I had to make payments I mean if it means costing you know what it costs but the thing about it is we don't realize that it costs if, if I took something I shouldn't take and stole something it cost somebody something I mean this is the favorite theme of most you know uh, larson, larceny and all the other theft and all the you know people burglary and everything oh their insurance will cover it yeah, hey, I want you to come pay my deductible, then take it. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Yeah, the, it's the guy who's going to rob the bank. Well, FDIC, they've got that banker's insurance and stuff, and they'll all be covered. Somebody's paying. It costs somebody something. It's time to repay it and take care of it. Oh, okay, uh, but I'll do it later. That's always the best excuse, amen? I'll do it later. Hey, there's no good reason to stay in bondage longer than you need to. Why don't you take care of it today? Why don't you do what God's telling you to do at this moment? Life and victory and, 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 and grace is a lot better life than outside of grace. Amen? Well, what if you say, well, if, well, I don't think they'll understand. Hey, it might be surprised at any rate. It's not going to kill you, but you need to get it done. And I found that many times in getting right with somebody, it, it does make a difference in their life as well and gives them an opportunity to sit back and think about what God's doing in their life. All right? Hey, who knows until you try? Hey, but I, you know, I was a little bit wrong. They were really wrong. This, by the way, is one of my favorites. You know, if you got excuses, this is a good one. All right. I like, well, I was a little wrong. They were really wrong. You know, I've discovered if I look at it from my perspective, I'm always just a little wrong. Because I'm so great. Excuse me, that's humorous, okay? <laughs> Even if you were a little wrong, all right, you're still wrong. 
So it doesn't justify it. You just do what you need to do, take care of it, and do the right thing, even if you're a little wrong. Make restitution, make it right. How about another good? Well, they're not Christians. <laughs> I don't even get right with them. They don't, they, don't, they don't even know the Lord. The better reason is that you, if they're not Christians, that you go take care of it right away and let them see what a Christian's like. Let them see some humility in your life. Let them see what God will do in a person's life when they get right. Well, I don't think that they'll remember. You remember. You know? And if you remember, that's enough. All right? There's a lot of things I don't remember, but I'll tell you one thing. There's a lot of things I'd like to forget and seek to forget, but if the Holy Spirit's bringing it up, it's time to do something about it. Because we're talking about this conscience where the Holy Spirit's working in our heart and our conscience and dealing with us. And if he says something to me, I don't need to justify it, rationalize it, excuse it. I just need to go do what God wants me to do, whether they remember or not, no matter just responding the right way. This is a good one. Well, it happened long before I was ever saved. It happened before I was saved. Excuse me. Let's say I'm not saved, and I go rob a bank. I get away with a million dollars. Day or two later, I give my life to Jesus. I have, a, I have a, a revolutionary encounter with Jesus Christ. My heart has changed. Let me ask you this. At what point in that little illustration did that money become mine? Never. Make restitution. Now, I, I want to say that that's just some common excuses. I'm sure we can all come up with a few more if we want to add to the list, amen, because we all have them and we can all justify every deed of the flesh the Bible says. But there are some questions that always come up when you start talking to people about making restitution or getting things right from a bad relationship or something, you know, wasn't right. Somebody was offended. And so I, I want to take, just close out this, this, this message today with, with a few answers to questions that seem to be the most obvious. When should I confess publicly something and when should I keep something private? I'll say this because I've seen, I've been in revival meetings where God broke out and people are getting right with God and confessing and then I've seen preachers get up and say, well, we should all confess our sins publicly one to another. And the Bible says confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. But that doesn't mean that the whole church. It means one to another, all right? Now, if I've offended the whole church, guess who I should confess to? Old church. If I've offended you, who should I confess to? You. If I've offended my family, who should I go to? My family. The scope, the measure of it depends on the confession model, model that you'll follow there. If otherwise, you can just make a whole bunch of people mad. Amen? So you're cautious and you're discerning when it comes to confession like that. The second question sometimes is, what if I know that clearly, that, that clearly my conscience is going to harm somebody else? All right? I mean, there's a situation that might have potential to implicate someone or harm someone or demand, you know. Well, if that's the way it is, those situations obviously require a greater care and demand wisdom. If your situation can create harm to anyone in your church fellowship, obviously you want to seek your pastor's counsel. We, you know... We have some, some men here who are trained in the Word of God. We have some elders here who are trained in the Word of God. You can go to them and say, listen, I need some instruction here about something I've done. And, you know, and someone else is involved. And, you know, I, I really need to get some help and some insight here. And, and, you know, God works through spiritual leadership and spiritual authority. One of the big questions that comes up sometimes is what about confessing immorality? All right. Which is probably the most difficult type of confession. If I was wrong about something, you know... Uh, you, you should never, first of all, just confess adultery just because somebody told you to do it. We respond to that confession as the Holy Spirit tells you to do it, as the Spirit guides because this, you know, there's several points of wisdom, and I just, just very quickly to consider when you're clearing your conscience regarding to a sexual sin. You know, if the person with whom you committed that sin is someone in your church, you definitely need to start with your pastors. Because God wants to bring healing and God wants to bring restitution, not more disaster. And what happens when you include your pastor, now there's this invited accountability. All right? And more and more today than ever before, this, this, is, this is happening within the church is, it, it, more than any other time in history. Because this culture that we're living is it just plays to that. So you, when you're making this type of confession, you want to, obviously, you want pastoral accountability you want so you want to obviously know god's timing and god's place you know uh, 
that you really have a word from God about that. Uh, you don't go into unnecessary or explicit details. But I will say this, because what I've seen is someone who's come to me and says, I've been uh, you know, unfaithful and I want to confess this to my wife. And, and then they go to their wife and they don't really, they don't need to be explicit about it, but they need to tell if they've been unfaithful more than one person. Because what is going to find, happen, I will let you know right now, is that when your spouse, your husband, or your wife finds out there's been unfaithfulness, they're going to begin to be curious about events of your life over the last months, weeks, and years. They're going to be curious about what's on your phone. They're going to be curious about what's in your emails. Be, and if they discover that you haven't been completely honest with them, you have ruined the whole thing. Just get clean. Just get right. Just get it out. Just get right with God. So you seek God regarding timing. You consider even having a trusted third party present like a pastor or some of you, it's, a, it's an elder or someone has some maturity in their life. And you get it all out the first time. And understand though that when you confess your sin, there's most likely going to be a sense of release in your life and a sense of freedom of getting that weight off your shoulder that you probably haven't experienced before. But you need to understand at the same time, you have just dumped a whole load of mess on your spouse. And they're going, to have to, they're going to have to respond. And it's not going to be with freedom that you're experiencing now. It's going to be a sense of rejection, a sense of frustration, a sense of betrayal. They're going to have to deal with all that. And then they're going to need time on top of all that to sort all that particular mess out. It's a grieving process. It's a rebuilding process. It's a, it's a trust has to be restored. And true confession will bring with that to the table that willingness to be patient for as long as it might take with the pain that your spouse is having to endure because of what you've done before they come to a place of freedom again in their life. It's a difficult situation. What if my list, this is one I felt right about, it's too long. And it, you know, start making my list of people I've offended. It can be overwhelming, perhaps, if you've been living in your life where you just ignored what God said to you. Because we can live in a, certainly a narcissistic you know, culture of just selfishness, amen? This is a very selfish world we live in. And some people, you know, you know can offend people without realizing their offense. Part of my problem, folks, of offending people, and I've gotten better over the years, but mine is, you know, I have this warped sense of humor. And I may say something in jest, just being funny with somebody that, deeply hurts their feelings. I see you looking at each other like that. You, you know what you're Some of you can raise your hands like that. You know, just, it's, you thought it was funny, but it was stupid. All right. You thought it was hilarious, but it was hurtful. And if you start getting real honest about that, then the list can get a little long. But however the list, how long it is, you just start working through the list. Make the list of people. That's, you don't have to write down about it. Just say, Lord, you show me who it is. And just take it one step at a time and start getting your conscience clear. And it, there may be somebody, well, I don't even know where this person is. God has a unique way of bringing people across your paths. It, you know, I, I've had that happen in my own life. When uh, just someone I know that I wished I could have talked to or something. And, and years later, this person crossed my path. Then you take the opportunity. It, isn't it amazing how God is always working on our behalf anyway? way to help us walk in freedom and to help us that the Holy Spirit's ministry is profound in the life of a believer when they just start getting right with God so don't be surprised if God starts working miracles in your life to make these situation happens now this is a tragic one the next one is and this is where people say yeah, that a lot of times the family situations well I, that person has died and I still feel guilty what should I do It was Life Action Ministries who said, you know, consider writing a letter of confession to the deceased as if that person were still alive. It will deepen the spirit of confession in you. He says, you may even want to address the letter to God as a means of finding closure, expressing trust that you're now turning over to God what is beyond your control. And by the way, that's the bulk of our Christian life anyway, turning over to God what's beyond our control. And putting it in his hands and just recognizing that it's there in your life and then committing it to him. It's amazing how God can bring freedom. Another common excuse is this. What if clearing my conscience also involves accusing someone else of wrongdoing? I know it's similar to what we said a while ago. But if there's two people involved in the same wrongdoing is the idea. One, you never reflect negatively on another person in confession. All right? We're not dealing with them. For example, you don't say, well, we were both wrong, but would you forgive me for my part? It's not your responsibility to confess they're wrong. You just, you just, you know, you take 100% responsibility for your actions. 
You take responsibility for what you've done. You leave the rest with the other person. You leave the rest with God. Remember, you're clearing your conscience, not their conscience, all right? And in some extremely rare cases with your confession might implicate somebody else about maybe like in a crime, you're going to, have to trust God's sovereignty over, over everybody's life. You're not trying to push someone into some kind of legal trouble as you confess your sin. But the Bible says as much as possible to live at peace with all men. And we take those steps. Last little closing question would be this. What if my sin against someone has been mostly in my head as in bad attitudes or just negative thoughts should I tell them? Not usually. Not usually. For the most part, it's only appropriate to confess that wrongdoing to God. Maybe it's in your heart. Maybe it's a personality click you got with somebody or you just have an attitude that's affected your relationship for whatever reason. You know, uh, the last thing you need to do is go and say, hey, I don't like you. <laughs> now we have an offense. <laughs> you walk in humility. God's doing a work of brokenness in your life. You don't have to try to make somebody else humble too. All right? Let God work in your life. Now, these two messages are really important, and I think they're a message that should be preached occasionally through a year where we just have a tendency to sit back and say, hey, it's time for some house cleaning. You know, spring's almost over. Summer's here. Let's do our spring cleaning spiritually. Let's clean out those closets. Let's, let's straighten up those offenses. Why am I carrying this stupid junk for? You know? And yeah, it might have been a big deal, but I want you to know the bigger deal is that I be, I'm right with God, and the bigger deal, if God forgave me of everything he's forgiven me of, certainly I can forgive them. If God's met my need, I can certainly be someone who points other people to the way I have their needs met, but I need my heart right with God. And I don't want to live with these agitations and these nervousness and these fears and this despair and this depression and this fatigue because I'm not willing to do the right thing. God, you're my God. I just want to follow you. Lord, so you search me and seek me and see if there be any harmful way in me. Test me if necessary to expose whatever might be in my life and see what God does in your life. It's profound that if we would just simply take this little bit of advice in these last two sermons, how that would, I believe, radically turn your whole life around. But when the conscience gets clear and the heart gets clean, it is a powerful, powerful way to live your life. If not, it can be a depressing way, especially as a Christian, because in your heart, you know what's right. And when you're denying it, and the heart's just getting harder, and you drift more into that passionless, kind of living. There's no passion, no zeal, no enthusiasm for the will of God and for the things of God. Amen? I want to give us an invitation this morning. I believe the Holy Spirit has spoken to our hearts. Let's just be open to the Lord. If there's something you need to turn over to the Lord this morning, I'd encourage you as we, as we give this invitation today that you would just make your way.